Um, nice to see you for those who are, are new in the room. Um, this is the second panel of the Ocean of Knowledge uh, conference, and this panel is about traditional uh, sea craft and traditional uh, skills, navigation skills, and the like. And I'm going to get the ball rolling uh, talking about traditional Pacific sailcraft. This will make more sense to you if you've ever gone sailing. Um, sorry, this is somebody's dongle or something. Oh, that's the click, all right, sorry. Um, I'm a sailor and, and I sail on, uh, off LA waters and I've, I've realized that Los Angeles really isn't a maritime city. If you moved LA to Arizona, most people wouldn't notice. <laughs> Except for the one time a year they go to the beach. It's a very different kind of relationship with the water from, from communities which are deeply integrated with the water. I mean, even if you go to San Francisco or, or New York or, or, or San Diego, you're constantly crossing the water, taking ferries, bridges, bus, you know, uh, uh, tunnels, etc., etc. Involved with the littoral zone between land and water constantly. So anyway, that's just an observation about LA, which is not really um, on the water. It's pretty relevant. Anyway, what's so special about Pacific sailcraft? Well, they're crazy looking boats. They were big and small. They were great fleets. They made major seafaring achievements. They traveled at high speed. They have qualities of remarkable engineering, sophisticated <coughs> skills, sustainable production, adaptation to local resources, development of sophisticated materials from local raw materials, and they have unique geometry and behavior, shunting, asymmetry, and vortex lift. So I'm gonna run through some of this stuff for you. It really is a primer, and I know that Mario will go into much greater detail about some particulars about a particular flavor of Pacific sailcraft. Um, I don't know if Mimi's in the room, but, but these are Mimi's people, and I just love these boats. They are so, they're just like spaceships, really, aren't they? They're so crazy, and I love these guys on here. It's like a couple of dudes on their Harleys, you know, <laughs> cruising up the freeway, but no, the whole Pacific Ocean is their freeway, and they made their Harley out of stuff in their backyard. So, extraordinary, beautiful objects highly functional uh, and, and remarkably beautiful. Here are some, just a few, this is a bit of a scrapbook here, some different designs of different traditional Pacific sea craft. I want to point out in this image, uh, two of the, or three in fact, uh, qualities of the, of the Pacific sailcraft which, which t tends to be uh, well widely distributed. We've got two hulls, and they are very, very different, right? The main hull, as you can see, is itself asymmetrical. One side is more curved than the other. That actually has a hydrodynamic effect. It gives the hull lift, right? And thirdly, the, the nature of the sail, which is um, uh, so propped up in the middle with a mast, but, but uh, uh, terminates at one bow. Now we'll talk a little bit more about this cross beams and the way they're constructed in a moment. Here's uh, the, the more commonly Polynesian style craft which are catamarans, two symmetrical hulls. So we have two quite different kinds of sail craft. We have the symmetrical hull double canoe and the asymmetrical canoe without rigor and they behave differently and they were used for different purposes. <coughs> um, these boats were documented as long ago as 1519. Um, and William Dampier, who was an early explorer, said, I've been particular in describing these boats because I believe they sailed the best of any boats in the world. Right? And he attempted to test the speed of these boats and he said, I do believe she would have run at 24 miles an hour. 
Now, that's at a time when Western boats travelled at four miles an hour. So the, 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 the oceanic technologies were already extraordinarily advanced. And the nature of the engineering and the nature of the design is, you might say, orthogonal to Western traditions. It's a completely separately uh, evolved and developed tradition. And, and the two traditions are, in many ways, in terms of engineering, quite different. Now, note here, we've got a lot of people from Guam. Um, uh, I was told that one of these boats was sent to Manila, which is above 400 leagues, he says 480, and it made it in four days. How far is it from Guam to Manila? Anyone know offhand? 2,500 miles? 2,500 miles, something like that. It's a very big distance over open ocean, four days. Stunning. Wow. Yeah. And this is the, I'm going to, as I said, this is a bit of a scrapbook. These are different flavors of boats from different parts of the world, different parts of the Pacific. This is a really bad Western rendering of a <laughs> flying pro. This, this pro ain't gonna fly. <laughs> it's atrocious. It's hilarious. We got this size right. So, as uh, Pete has, uh, we have discussed with Pete, um, it was documented uh, when, when um, this Spanish galleon arrived in in Guam that they were surrounded by. Four or five hundred ships. So, and that's the origin of, of the name of Pete's organisation, Five Hundred Sails. They're attempting to build the uh, build the build the fleet back up to to that number. Now, this is a quote from Reverend Thomas West, 1865, and he's talking here about the Tongan uh, naval might. He's saying, undoubtedly the Tongans are foremost among islanders for their maritime ability and enterprise. Their large double sailing canoes are beautifully constructed, each hull is from 40 to 90 feet long. Right? It's longer than this room. Right? Each would carry about 100 to 150 persons. The whole structure bound together without the use of a single nail or bolt of any kind. Now, that's one of the very special qualities about these craft is that they're tied together, right? And the way that they're lashed together and bound together is, is particular. Uh, and there's lots of varieties. So he says, this is great. Up went the huge sail, down went the great oars, splashing into the sea. Away we shot like a racehorse. The breeze was strong. Every timber of the canoe creaked. Owing to the great rate at which we were going, the sea was like a hissing cauldron. Europeans have never sailed this fast. Right? We got to Lifuka in about three hours, having run a distance of 38 miles. It's not until the middle of the century that any Western sailcraft could sail that far. Right? And this is 1865. And he says at the bottom here, they have a wonderful advantage over all sailing vessels of European construction. This is a side issue, actually. I found this in the, this is the Encyclopedia Seneca of 1917 about the, um, the pirates of the Ladrones. Notice here, and these people were obviously great maritime uh, peoples. In 1809, the pirates had increased in number to 70,000 with 1,800 ships. And earlier on, he says, some were up to 200 tons carrying 12 guns, and I assume by guns, they mean cannons. Now, this may also be a contested history. So, I don't know, but it's, it's fascinating that at this point, this moment in colonial history, this community really ruled the seas in that area. But it appears that way from this report. So here are some relatively large um, Traditional sailing vessels, again, here in, these are in the Marshall Islands, and, and you can see by the style of the boats, the western boats in the background, there's a square rigger right at the back and this schooner, uh, bowsprit schooner in the mid-ground there, that these boats, these boats were substantial. I'll show some, some just some 
shots. This is a lovely image. I don't know where it's from, but of a kind of armada in a, in a Pacific harbor. Again, a Marshallese wallop. Now I want to talk about just a few qualities of construction and design. Here again is a tepuke. And Mimi told me something very interesting about the tepuke, is that one of the reasons they go so fast is that the hulls are mostly underwater most of the time and therefore they're, they're, they're kind of behaving hydrodynamically more like torpedoes than, than boats. Mm -hmm. Now that's fascinating, right? So they're dugout logs sealed with a lid and with a special mastic that's made out of breadfruit sap and I wish she was here to <laughs> tell me. I think ash and breadfruit sap is one of the recipes. But um, And here's a, a, an older photograph. I don't know what that thing in the, in the air is. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but if anyone can tell me, I'd be very interested to know. It's a flying fish. Yeah, except that this photograph's 100 years old. It's a flying fish. What is that? <laughs> I, I, the only thing I can guess is it's a kind of kite, but I, I just don't know. Ah. But what's, you know, when you look at this structure, this extraordinary construction, with, with these two pods kind of cantilevered over these two hulls, it's, it's the most extraordinary invention. Now here's a close-up of, 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 of a wallop with, and, and showing the cross beams and the lashings, the multiple stays holding up the mast. And I think what's particularly interesting is this sprung yoke with Spanish windlasses at each end. I'm talking about is, is this. A very solid piece of hardwood with tightly wrapped bindings. That's called a Spanish windlass. And that functions as a kind of springing suspension that permits the outrigger to rock in the fore and aft direction without moving in any of the other planes. That's fantastic. <laughs> no, I mean, it's the, the, the quality of design um, and the refinement and precision that, that these boats are built to is truly awesome. Here's an a, a image I found of, of lacing this special shaped sail onto the spars for a tepuke. And, uh, you know, these are the tools they use. And some of them are a little too modern for my taste. <laughs> and here's an example. I've got a couple of examples of the way that the planks are held together with these coconut fiber bindings. Now, you know, they're all different, and many of you seen, have seen much better examples, but this is just to give those of you who are unfamiliar with these traditions a sense of the, the indigenous techniques and the precision of those techniques. The way that, uh, you know, you can see the, the ads hewn dugout hull there, the way that the, these um, side planks are bound to a, a, a dugout hull, etc., etc. You know, and these things do long distance oceanic voyages. And, and as, as Larry was explaining to me yesterday, yeah, sometimes the bindings break and you have to do repairs at sea. Mm -hmm. But the design supports repairs at sea, right? Which is also really important. It's a really fundamental kind of sustainability. And here's a, a detail of, of this kind of hull asymmetry, um, which is also particularly uh, oceanic. This is an image of, of, of um, a particular uh, method of, uh, of attaching the, the outrigger to the cross beams. And I want to draw your attention to the geometry. Each of those four struts, uh, the four struts and the hull and the, and the cross beam define a tetrahedron. Now, a tetrahedron is the most stable, rigid geometrical form. It's, what, it's the first platonic solid, right? So there's a kind of level of understanding of engineering and geometry here that, that is remarkably sophisticated, realized 
in the available materials. Here are some images of, of uh, some of the traditional sail shapes, just to give you a, a sense of the diversity of shapes. Now I want to talk just a little bit about this amazing thing called shunting. Now, those of you who have sailed a western boat will know that you can't sail directly into the wind. That's impossible, right? So, but you can sail close to the wind, closer on a well-crafted ship and not so close on a not so good ship. And you have to turn in this zigzag course, and that's what's called tacking. And in English, when we say, you're going to take another tack. That's what this means. When you take another tack in an argument, you were going that way, and now you're going that way. Right? <laughs> so um, that's what Western boats do. Now notice that the Western boat is bilaterally symmetrical. It has a bow and a stern, and the two sides are identical. Compare this with the with the asymmetrical outrigger canoe, which is symmetrical in the opposite axis. It's symmetrical end for end and bilaterally asymmetrical, right? which is what I meant about these two traditions being you know, fundamentally different. Right? Now, in, in comparison, a, a proa or outrigger canoe will shunt. That means it will, if you follow the numbers, it will sail and then fall off the wind, reverse direction, and go the other way. Jive. No, shunt. Well, they call it a shunt because it reverses direction. It's not just a jive. Okay. The boat reverses direction. The bow becomes the stern. But the outrigger stays on the same side with respect to the wind. So, completely different theory of sailing, basically. Now, as I said here, the symmetrical Polynesian Catamarans, sorry about the typo, they usually tack. They have a bow and a stern. It's the asymmetrical outrigger boats that have, have, do this shunting thing here. Um, and some asymmetrical craft do tack. This is an interesting archival photograph of a hybrid craft which has a oceanic kind of hull and outrigger shape. In fact, it's strange because it's got a second outrigger on the lee side are on the windward side, which is very curious. And it's got western-derived gaff. It's a, essentially, in the west, we call that a gaff schooner. Uh, and again, I don't know where that image is from. I've just been trawling the web for years, and I've put this scrapbook together. So here's the comparison, right? That, 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 that This is a French one. The wind, uh, uh, one on the left is tacking, and the one on the right is shunting. Just a completely different way of how to get upwind. And here's a more detailed image of, of how the sails are handled in the um, process of shunting. Now, this is where the, 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 the crab claw rigged oceanic uh, um, outrigger canoe it is difficult to handle. Because in order to shunt, you've got to pick that sail and two yards up and drag it from one end of the boat to the other. And, uh, that's hard work. And anyone who has sailed these canoes, and I have to admit, I haven't, um, but anyone who has sailed these canoes will attest to the fact that that's a complex process and hard work. And, as we discussed yesterday, um, it limits maneuverability in close quarters. Isn't that right, Pete? Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, correct me at any point. <laughs> So, but you know, for all that, these are pretty rocking boats. Right? That looks like a lot of fun. <laughs> right? Here's it. This, the, the, the sail here is clearly made out of rice bags. Mm -hmm. So now I just want to talk about, well, why was it that the Westerners, <coughs> 400 years of exposure to this remarkable seafaring tradition, didn't take it up? <laughs> What's going on? 
You know, it's amazing. So this is, this is a kind of pet subject of mine. I've been researching this for a while and it's slightly off topic, but bear with me because I think it's relevant to where we get to at the end. Now here's um, Henry Coleman Folkard, 1870. He's saying, the invention of the flying crower is one of, which, one of which would do honor to the most educated and ingenious of mankind. And he says, the natives are no less dexterous in the management of the prower than they are in the building of it. The form and construction of the flying prower is in direct opposition to the principles of boat building as adopted in England and indeed in almost every other country in the world. Now that's after 350 years of contact between Westerners and Pacific peoples. Along comes Nathaniel Hereshoff, one of the great naval architects of the United States of this period. And this is, and he builds this boat called Amaryllis, and this is a nice story, and it's actually reflective of the story that I want to tell you about Greg and the Roberta L in a moment or two. So, Harishoff builds a catamaran and enters it in a race in the New York Yacht Club and tears the pants off everything else in the fleet. And, it's just, it's, and this guy, Captain Coffin, sad name, but um, highly regarded, says, Amaryllis could just be justly claimed to be the fastest thing of her inches under canvas that floats. The fastest sailboat in the world of its size. Now, here's what's in it. here's interesting, right? If you look at the Amaryllis, it's a proa. It's not a catamaran, right? You've got the sail and the and the, and the crew on one hull, and the outrigger off to one side. Right? Now, in the law of, of in the sailing law, Amaryllis is referred to as the first catamaran in the Western tradition. Although there's a record of someone trying to do something in the 1820s, no, I couldn't find much about it. Anyway, they disqualified her from the race because she was neither yacht nor boat. <laughs> you know, so that's part of the reason, right? It's like, these sailing people are just really conservative. But with good reason, in a way. But they don't take the change kindly. He sold four uh, of these, these boats and, and their the man arrested for some time. In fact, Hereshoff became so involved with designing and building steamers, the new maritime art, uh, that, that he, he didn't design sailboats for quite a while. And then he went on to design some uh, winning, uh, race winning, uh, conventional sailcraft. And here's another image from 1878 of three or four catamarans on New York Harbour. Again, you can see that uh, that they're effectively proas, and you can also see that the outrigger is on the quote wrong side mm -hmm. if you're <clears throat> observant. Mm. So now we get into the 20th century, and and from what I can tell, it was Woody Brown's um, Hawaiian Polynesian inspired catamarans that he built in in uh, in Hawaii right after the Second World War. That, that really began the modern, uh, well, I shouldn't say that, in the Anglo-American world. It began the resurgence of interest in, in multi, so-called multi-hulls. Here's another adventurer designer, James Warren, who sailed down the Atlantic and into the Caribbean and here and there on a 23-foot catamaran that he built himself in 1953, the company of two German women. And he himself was inspired by a Frenchman, Eric de Bischoff, who sailed a double canoe from Hawaii, I think it actually was Tahiti to France. I had a picture of that, where's it gone? I'll get to it in a minute probably. Anyway, there's a saying in the sailing world that if multi-hull people are the lunatic fringe of the sailing community, and proa people are the lunatic French of the multi hull community. Uh, yeah. Hi! <laughs> and here's to Bischoff's junk rigged catamaran, which he sailed from the Caribbean into Arctic waters and back up to France in 1939. Wow. Yeah. 
actually, the, the, there's a whole French tradition in this stuff that, that, that those of us who are not Francophones find very difficult to get into. But in, in Polynesian uh, and in, in oceanic anthropology and also in, in modern sailing experiments based on the, on the oceanic traditions, the French are at least as inventive as anyone in the English speaking world, if not more so. Um, so we should look at that. Um, so here's another case. This is, this is a flying proa designed by R.M. Munro, who was a, a leading sort of yacht designer in the end of the 19th century. Sailing is no name for it. Flying is better. <laughs> Out into the bay she skipped, the boys yelling with delight. Uh, and the steering oar riven into vapour by the speed blowing the wind into the wind. Now, this is where I come to this interesting story about a um, Carolinian flying proa built in Chicago on a second floor apartment by steel workers in 1967 or so. And I a great pleasure to tell you the story and, and to have been part of what's just a really sweet story. So these guys, and I, and I want to know more background, they, they won a 333-mile sailing boat race in their homemade uh, flying prior, which was based on drawings made by a British naval draftsman in 1740s? 1742. This is a fantastic story. And this boat beat the giant sailboats of millionaires in Chicago. In fact, not only beat them, all the boats took off and they sat there drinking beer for two hours. I have this from Greg, right? <laughs> They gave the fleet a head start of two hours and then beat the fleet by five hours and got there before the finishing line committee got there. And as a result, the win is not recorded in the records of the Chicago Yacht Club, as far as I can discover. Now, last summer, a boat wrecker friend of mine sent me a, a Craigslist posting that said 41 foot sailing canoe. And I went, what? And, uh, and so, and this was in the time when I was, you know, working on building up this conference and, and made contact with Joanne Gregg and, and, uh, and it turns out that the Roberta L, this pro had been in Greg's possession for many years and was now sitting in a field up in the back of Ojai somewhere. And the Roberta L is now <laughs> the flagship of the 500 sales organization in Cyprus. <laughs> and that's just so fantastic. And it's so fantastic in so many different ways. Anyway, that's the Roberta L. And that's a, and, 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 but here's the thing, Pete told me, it's built to the, exactly the same drawing that they're building their fleet. I mean, the, the extraordinary kind of synchronicity and, and, and sort of circular historical story, uh, I really, it really bears telling. It's a fascinating story. Now, what was the pulp material? Was that? I mean, since they were steel workers, it's not It's steel. It's, ply of, it's glass and ply, right. or it's, it's marine ply, like strip plane marine ply. Greg, Greg I, I'll ask, I'll ask you, guys, Greg, stand up, please. Sure. So this is Greg, he's the yeah. previous owner of uh, the uh, uh, and, and, and it's Pete, who, uh, Pete's now the, now the, as, as uh, the 500 sales organization. Yeah. 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 So, let me resume. This is an interesting historical moment. This is a boat, which is kind of a proa, but it's a whole new thing, designed by Dick Newick, famous uh, multi-hull designer. This boat was sailed single-handedly across the Atlantic by one man, came third in a single-handed transatlantic race. 
What's interesting about this boat is that it's sort of a proa, but the outrigger is on the leeward side, not on the windward side. Right? So somebody coined the neologism an Atlantic proa because a Pacific proa has the, the outrigger on the windward side, so they call these Atlantic proas. Can I, can I interject? Ah, oh, please. Really quick. So Dick knew it. He won this race, and he well, it was Tom Fallon actually who decided. Yes, but it was his design. Yeah. yeah. And uh, his colleague is a man named Derek Kelsall. And Derek Kelsall invented um, a technique of resin infusion that's used today to make a canoe out of a flat panel and bend it. And it was Derek Kelsall who took me to that guy's house in Sausalito to meet him because they're friends. And it was Derek Kelsall who taught our organization, me and the others that work at 500 Sales, including um, Mario, who came up from San Diego after building a wooden one. It was Derek Kelsall who taught us how to work with fiberglass. <laughs> was it really? And how cool. It's all connected. That's very nice. So so here's, here's what I mean about the so-called Pacific Prower and the so-called Atlantic Prower. In the Pacific Prower, the outrigger functions as a counterweight. Now notice, in a western boat, you'd have a keel down here functioning like a pendulum with a couple of tons of lead on it. I know this. So what happens is if you get rid of that keel, then the boat will fall over <coughs> unless you can balance it in another way. And the two ways you can balance it is to have a heavy counterweight on the side that's going up or have a flotation on the side that's going down. Right? And so the Atlantic mode experiments with the idea of having a flotation hull on the leeward side, which is being forced into the water by the pressure of the wind on the sails, but the other byproduct of not having a keel is that you need far less hull because the hull of a conventional boat is an air cavity which keeps the hull afloat. So far less hull, far less friction. Go fast. Less weight, less friction. You win in two ways. That's why these boats are so fast. My boat, a 36 foot sloop, has 2,400 pounds of lead on the bottom of it. So it has to have a big air cavity in order to hold that pile of lead up. So here's, uh, here's Cheers, sailed by Tom Follett. So, um, and, no, and this is, what a mariner. He didn't just cross the Atlantic, oh no. no. He sailed the boat up from the Caribbean to England sailed across the Atlantic in the race, and then sailed back down to the Caribbean, single-handed, in that boat. Here's another pro experiment. There's an outfit in Britain called the uh, Association for Yacht Racing, AYRS. Anyway, this is the famous crossbow, which in 1972 set the world speed sailing record. And that's a funny looking craft, and it only goes in one direction. Right? Purpose-built racing craft, but that's a pretty funny image. The French, of course, yeah. were all over it. This is a lovely Atlantic proa called Tahiti Douche, designed by Daniel Charles. And there's, uh, there's the skipper in his little cubby hole, all the big winches and stuff around there. And this is a Tasmanian proa. Australians seem to like proas too. Now, I don't know much about it, about face, and I don't know where it's gone, but a very interesting looking boat. And here are just a few other modern out, uh, asymmetrical outrigger inspired craft of Pacific or Atlantic flavors. This one is a very unusual <laughs> And it's junk rigged. So it makes it even more bizarre when it's got a sail Yeah, it's a lovely piece of work though. It still looks like something from out of Jules Verne, doesn't it? <laughs> and I want to now talk about a couple of Frenchmen. I love these guys. Manuel and Maximilien Baird. These guys sailed across the Atlantic without instruments and without maps in the oceanic style in this boat, a 20-foot 
lug-sailed catamaran. And I, I, they, they appear to have reinvented for themselves Micronesian-style celestial navigation. And they're interesting lads, and they've gone on to do other sorts of nautical adventures, but that's the Micromegas 3, barely 20 feet long. There's only room for one person to sleep at a time, no auto tiller, no compass, no radio, no maps, no charts, no radar, nothing. <laughs> right? <laughs> and here's a funny thing. It's sort of kind of funny. So they uh, they've made a little documentary about this. You can you can see it, and and at some point they are just beginning to lose it <laughs> because. It's been cloudy for two weeks, and they can't see the stars, and they don't know if they've been going around in circles. So that's why the Vikings didn't use celestial navigation. But the Vikings had another trick up their sleeve. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm riffing now, but this is really interesting. The Vikings, had, or somebody discovered a mineral a translucent or transparent mineral which polarizes light. And they could look at this dull, overcast sky and find the sun or the moon behind the clouds. Wow. All right, now I'm going to finish up now because this is kind of the epitome of, of where you might take this theory of sailing, um, this is Sail Rocket, actually Sail Rocket 2, which holds the world sailing record. And it is, in a sense, a proa of sorts. Right? It's, it's got an outrigger, it's got one sail, and this thing flies. 75 miles an hour she's <laughs> in 23 knots of wind. This boat goes three times as fast as the wind. Now, yeah, that's interesting. And it's up on it's up on um, on hydrofoils. So this, you know, the amount of boat that's actually in the water is about this much, as it's staggering. So there's great video, just go check it out, it's quite fun. And there's another view of Sail Rocket. It's a, it's a wing sail, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a semi-hard sail. The, there's a, but it's essentially built like an airplane wing. It's a, it's a, there's a lot of aeronautics, uh, aeronautical design and aerodynamic design in this, including the angle of the sail which prevents the boat from flipping, right? There's actually some, pr some pressure down on the boat generated by the sail, so the whole thing just won't go over. There's a spectacular image of Sail Rocket 1 taking off in the air and cartwheeling. Oh, pitch pole. Pitch pole, but it's way out of the water. So that's why he's wearing a crash helmet. Yeah. Probably has an ejector seat. <laughs> No, it's a kind of hybrid because it because it's got the the mass that is the person and the bigger hull on the windward side and the you might call it the outrigger with the sail on it on the leeward side. So it, it's a it's a hybrid. It's not an Atlantic. It's not a pro. It's not a Atlantic. It's not a Pacific. It's also not what they call an Indian or Harry pro. That's getting. I, I just noticed an analogy of the tips of modern jets have that same shape. The spoiler. Yeah, yeah. That's a, a very sophisticated craft. Okay, I, um, I'm going to stop. look at that. I'm going to stop. Thank you so much for your attention.